A live transcript coming actually can you see that mm -hmm. let me start that over hold on a little more it's because i could my screen isn't letting me see what i'm doing there it's good now it's I working see, no. okay good great all right so great i think we can start letting people in can i meet them Christine? yep yep go for it Welcome everyone. We're just gonna let the room fill up for a few minutes and before we get started. Welcome everybody. We're just letting the room fill up and then we'll get started in just a moment. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our event. My name is Christine Schmidt, and I'm the Deputy Director and Head of Research at the Wiener Holocaust Library. Um, of course, good evening or good afternoon, depending on where you're logging in from. We are very pleased to welcome you to tonight's event and to host what promises to be a fascinating conversation between Professors Ed Westerman and Dan Stone on Professor Westerman's new book, Drunk on Genocide, Alcohol and Mass Murder in Nazi Germany. Professor Westerman's book examines for the first time how alcohol consumption and celebration among the SS and police became part of rituals of humiliation in the camps, ghettos, and killing fields of the Holocaust. Professor Westerman's study overturns the common misconception of the SS and police as stone cold killers and argues that they were in fact intoxicated with the act of murder itself. His book highlights the intersections of masculinity drinking ritual, sexual violence, and mass murder to expose the role of alcohol and ce celebratory ritual in the Nazi genocide of European Jews. Before I introduce our speakers, just a, a few notes of our usual housekeeping. Everyone is gonna be kept on mute during the entire uh, presentation, the entire discussion, but please feel free to drop any questions or comments in the chat, and we will try to get to as many as possible after the formal conversation is over. We are recording this event, but your camera won't be shown on YouTube on our um, recording. If you require closed captioning, I've turned this feature on um, and you can find it at the bottom of your screen um, and you can toggle it on and off as needed. I'll also be putting this in the chat. Um, I'll also include in the chat some information on how to purchase Professor Westerman's book um, at a discount provided by the publishers. If you have any technical problems during the event, please uh, send a direct message to me or my colleague, Sonia, and we will try our best to help. So now to our speakers. Professor Ed Westerman is Regents Professor of History at Texas A&M University in San Antonio, a commissioner on the Texas Holocaust and Genocide Commission, and author most recently of Hitler's Ostkrieg and the Indian Wars. His areas of expertise include modern European history, the Holocaust and war and society. We're really delighted to have him here with us this evening. He will be led in conversation by Dan Stone, who is Professor of Modern History and Director of the Holocaust Research Institute at Royal Holloway University of London. 
His research interests include the history and interpretation of the Holocaust, comparative genocide, history of anthropology, history of fascism, the cultural history of the British right, and theory of history. So with, without further ado, handing over to Dan. Thank you, Christine, and uh, welcome to, to Ed, and congratulations on, uh, on the book, which I have here, and um, I urge people to, to read it. I mean, I, uh, I have to confess to a small amount of professional jealousy uh, here, not least because uh, over the years when I've taught my course on, uh, on genocide at Royal Holloway, I have, I have on occasion um, observed when talking particularly about Rwanda to, to the students that uh, alcohol is not irrelevant in, uh, in the history of genocide and that somebody should write a book about it. And um, and now there is such a such a book which um, uh, kind of uh, you know you beat me to, beat me to it but um, so so I'm I'm but I'm really happy to see uh, to see this book because it's it's an extremely important topic um, much neglected I think even though in, in some ways it's been staring us in the face for for a long time and so I'm I'm really glad to see this book I, it's also uh, I have to say uh, to um, attendees at, at this event it's a it's a really tough book to read. Uh, I think we'll we'll discuss uh, that in in due course, um, but it's it, it's full. It's it's a catalogue of atrocities uh, in in many many ways. So perhaps for the first question, I'd like to ask you, uh, as Christine said, you know, you're you're known, I think, in Holocaust studies primarily for your work on perpetrators, and you come, uh, I think, I'm right in saying, out of military history, and and the book is published in a in a series on uh, on military history called Battlegrounds. That's the title of the series published by Cornell. And I wonder if, you, if you'd like to say something, first of all, about how you came to this topic and to what extent it, it grew out of your interests in, uh, in military history and in perpetrator studies. Well, uh, thanks, Dan. And first of all, just let me say thank you to Christine, Sonia, and the Wiener Library. I appreciate this opportunity. And I obviously appreciate the opportunity, uh, Dan, that you agreed to be a consultant. And I'm very glad that I beat you to the punch on this one because you would have written a better book and then I'd had no, no, no recourse. But uh, let, me just, uh, let me just answer your first question. Uh, certainly, uh, I think um, uh, military history, uh, as we now define it, uh, the new military history, which looks at social cultural aspects of experience, uh, is kind of beyond operational history, looking at battles, for example. I think that this fits in nicely when we talk about war and genocide. And as you've already mentioned in your, uh, in your question, we see, uh, we see manifestations of this kind of behavior and other genocides, which are also, if we look at Rwanda, uh, are tied to a civil war, right? So uh, this idea of uh, how war uh, and genocide uh, fit together and then looking more broadly at uh, how do the uh, perpetrators of atrocity, how do they function uh, in these kinds of environments? And uh, for me, as you mentioned, I, looked, I had looked at the police uh, as a macro organization, the Ordnungspolizei Order Police, uh, just and that was actually just after uh, Chris Browning's book had come out on ordinary men. I was working on that and uh, to try to think through uh, the ways in which uh, the ways in which individuals become uh, complicit or, or participate uh, in these acts of violence was important to me. And I looked at a thing called organizational culture, and this gets back to ha having served uh, for over a couple decades in the military, one of the things I was very familiar with is the uh, concept of organizational culture, command climate, Waitman Bourne, wh whose book I would recommend, Marching in the Darkness, also uses that construct uh, to talk about uh, how units themselves uh, can be conditioned by leadership and uh, organizational principles, shared beliefs. Uh, and uh, one of the things that really comes out in this book is the uh, concept of masculinity and shared comradeship and the importance of that. And I think uh, those who have been involved uh, in military units, we see that the manifestation, both good and bad, of those kinds of ideals of band of brothers, if you will. Uh, and so to me, this is a, this is a book uh, that brought together a lot of different, uh, a lot of different aspects. And I think in a more complex way than I as a historian 10 or 15 years ago would have been able to do it. I guess that's one of the advantages of getting older is we become maybe more thoughtful and we see more connections in, in the work that we're, uh, in the work that we're doing. So this, in my mind, is what the new military history is all about. Uh, thinking about uh, military units and their participation, 
uh, in war, and in this case, and in genocide, and uh, looking at the, the other thing that I'm very interested in, why do these men, and in some cases women, participate in these acts? Thanks, Ed. Uh, it's interesting that you, you refer here to your, your own uh, experience of serving in the military, because that, that doesn't really reveal itself in the book, apart from one or, one or two slight hints here and there. There's, there's, there's one point when you're talking about the noise of uh, gunfire, and, and you say, I think, um, anyone who's ever been close to a firing range will, will know. And I thought, well, I've never been close to a firing range, um, but, but you obviously have. And, and I wonder to what extent your, your own experience of the military and of uh, comradeship and, and uh, the male environment of the army has informed this book. You know, I think hypermasculinity is one of the things I talk about. And if you look at, you know, we can talk about rugby teams, we can talk about university fraternities, but we can also talk about I was a pilot uh, in the military and that it was a male fraternity in that case, really, for combat pilots or those in the combat arms. And uh, that changed, obviously, uh, more recently. But it does create when you have these kind of male spaces uh, and when you're kind of judged on your ability to do certain things, whether it's to shoot down other aircraft or to fly better uh, than someone else. It also transfers to uh, games at the bar. It transfers to drinking at the bar. It transfers into the way you think about uh, uh, masculinity and uh, the way you think about gender and uh, women. And so I think, you know, that one of the things that uh, that that a lived experience uh, that uh, that uh, we have as historians sometimes uh, gives us some more insights uh, into uh, the nature of how these groups might have been socialized uh, in their own experience. And I think that that's one of the things that comes through in the book, this kind of socialization of these men and where alcohol is an important point of that social experience. Uh, and uh, one of the things that you see very clearly uh, is those who refuse to participate uh, in that experience. Uh, one of the things I underline in the book, it's not just about saying, hey, I don't want to drink with you. It's about saying I'm not being part of the group. And oh, by the way, I'm also rejecting uh, indirectly participation in the activities we, we were involved in. Uh, and then you also get those kind of uh, uh, gendered rejoinders uh, to those individuals about being, you know, mother's boys, limp dicks, weak, uh, sissies, those kinds of things. And, uh, and again, I think that that's a theme that if we think about uh, sports uh, in general, I mean, I grew up in a period of U.S. high school football, but I'm, I'm guessing that soccer teams uh, that in the 70s, 80s, or 90s, there were manifestations of these same kinds of behaviors. So I think for some readers, that that will be a way, uh, an intro to see how these gender norms really do impact uh, uh, impact behaviors. And I think that that's an important part of the book. Yes, agreed. Thank you. Um, uh, you, you already said a little bit about this, but you, you said more about um, the new military history. But I wonder if I could quick briefly return you to perpetrator studies, because I, I wonder to what extent you feel that what you've done in this book um, builds on your previous work on perpetrators and to what extent it it furthers our understanding of, of perpetrators more generally. I mean, I know there's been a whole slew of studies of different agencies within the RSHA or outside of it and, and research institutes and actual physical perpetrators but how does this how does this change in any way our, our understanding of, of perpetrators? Well I think uh, uh, for example you, you've written a great deal on uh, on perpetrators and uh, and also um, manifestations of perpetrator behavior through historians depictions. Uh, in my case looking at the police early on one of the things I was struck by uh, was not just ideology, but how organizational culture establishes these kind of boundaries of acceptable behavior within a group. And what that means is not that every, uh, every individual has to gravitate to the extreme ends of the, of the expectations of the organization, but 
in fact, that they can gravitate those to, to those extreme ends. And in fact, will in many cases be rewarded for that. And that socialization and ideology are two key components uh, of that. So that's kind of been in the background uh, uh, when, I, when I did the book on the police. And I think it continues as your question kind of uh, notes here that uh, when we look at the way in which perceptions of masculinity, uh, shared drinking rituals, ritual in general, what we start to really see uh, is how perpetrators themselves become accommodated uh, to their actions and how they uh, learn to accept it. And when I talk about, uh, when I talk about, uh, for example, there's an example of a, uh, of a, a killer who's writing back uh, uh, to his wife. And uh, he says, you know, tomorrow, uh, tomorrow I'm going to be involved uh, in a killing action. And, you know, I've got, I've, I've got my ammunition. I hope it's enough. You know, he makes this kind of comment. And then when he tells his wife, yeah, it was a little bit hard at the beginning, but by the 10th group, I was really kind of in the groove, right? And so I think what we, what we also see uh, is members of the, uh, of the Einsatz group and those uh, death squads, you see in their letters and their reflections, uh, some interesting manifestations of that accommodation. And those who are not able to do it, uh, it are seen as having been weak. And I think Chris in his book, uh, Ordinary Men, also really brought this out in a, in a profound way that those who said they couldn't kill, it wasn't because they had moral uh, you know, feelings against it. That's not how they justified it. it. It was because they weren't strong enough to do this. And tying now in uh, these, uh, this idea of masculinity, I think really uh, this, uh, this idea really starts to help us explain in other ways uh, how the perpetrators could become complicit in these acts. And then the celebratory part of it really gets us to new territory, I think. Uh, and uh, one of the things that uh, this book really attempts to do is to kind of argue against the, the standard historiography in two respects. Uh, you had earlier mentioned something about industrialized killing as kind of our paradigm for thinking about the Holocaust. And, uh, you know, we talk about the creation of the killing centers as a way so that uh, the perpetrators wouldn't suffer psychological harm. Uh, you know, this could be more efficient. It could be uh, uh, more remote uh, for the killers themselves. Well, I think that this book, uh, uh, one of the things, the cataloging of the atrocity, especially in the book, what it attempts to do is to show, in fact, that uh, there are many uh, who became accustomed to this, uh, intoxicated with the act in two respects. Alcohol is one thing, a literal intoxication. But even more importantly, I think what the book uh, talks about is this kind of metaphorical intoxication of the killers, control over subject populations, control over those, uh, over those inferior dehumanized uh, individuals uh, who you now can pretty much, uh, you have carte blanche to do what you want with them. Uh, this idea of the free game, if you will, when we talk about uh, Jews in Eastern Europe. And uh, also where the military experience, I think, uh, comes in a little bit uh, of this, it's kind of like I tell my students, when they go off on spring break, uh, they enter a new kind of geography, if you will, it's an imagined geography for them, or they can do things or uh, say things or act in ways that they might not normally act in. And I think the same thing uh, applies to uh, military units when you go downrange, for example, uh, there are certain strictures that are lifted. Uh, uh, there are certain things like uniforms, hair cuts, those kinds of things, even behaviors that are no longer really enforced uh, in the way they would be back at home base. And so this kind of what Donald Bloxham talked about, the East is a zone of exception. Uh, I think that geography of a zone of exception uh, is an important part of this because that metaphorical intoxication of control over racial inferiors uh, is really an important uh, kind of matrix that overlays these actions. And then alcohol is a luxury good, uh, which is an, an, uh, an important part to discuss, I think, and the, uh, the massive use of alcohol uh, that we see, especially in the East, uh, I think is an important, uh, is an important aspect uh, of that as well. And uh, the second part of the book, I think the paradigm that I'm kind of uh, arguing against is, uh, after, uh, after the war, and if you look at the general historiography on the subject, it's about alcohol for coping. Uh, and the only way, you know, the only way that anyone could have been involved in these kinds of actions uh, was they had to drink. And then at the end of the day, they're 
putting their head down in their glass and going, woe is me, uh, here I, uh, I've had to do all these terrible things. Uh, and what I think really you see uh, in the book is that uh, that is uh, that that paradigm really doesn't hold up uh, when you start uh, going across this incorporation of celebratory ritual, the facilitation of uh, additional acts of violence that we see in the East. And I'll give you one example uh, that I talk about often uh, when I talk about the book uh, is uh, these policemen uh, who are celebrating uh, the new year. So they're celebrating on December 31st. Uh, in 1942. And what did they decide to do after they've been drinking and ringing in the new year? Well, they decide to get their weapons and they decide to go into the ghetto and to hunt Jews. And then one of the, uh, uh, one of the witnesses, a Jewish woman who sees this happening, uh, remarks on they came in, they were shooting people as a quote sport. And she uses that term as, as a sport. So to think about to think about how that unit, for example, wanted to start their new year was doing the things that they've been doing over the past year, which is murdering people. Uh, and uh, it, it comes out of a unit party to kind of move in that direction. So this, again, really, I think, complicates our understanding uh, of this coping mechanism, right? And there are certainly individuals who do use alcohol for coping, but there's, uh, there's really a number of reasons that alcohol is in use. And I think that uh, it starts to give us a real insight into the perpetrator's mindset that we have thus so far, I think, uh, in some of the literature kind of neglected because it's uncomfortable for us as normal individuals to imagine somebody could have taken uh, could have taken some enjoyment or joy uh, in the act of killing in these acts. And, uh, you know, Shaw Friedlander himself, uh, uh, in an earlier work, uh, in his work on memory, uh, made that uh, kind of made that uh, statement. And it was, it was, it was kind of a, a, a statement aside, if you will. But what you really see in looking at a lot of these, uh, a lot of these witness statements, is the witnesses themselves who describe the joy, the laughter, the enjoyment, the amusement, these terms that are used uh, of the perpetrators while they're conducting these acts. And I think that's, a, that's really an important part uh, of the story. Thank you, that's a really um, a very full answer. And I'll, I'll come back, I think, to, um, to the issue of masculinity and to the literal metaphorical um, notion of intoxication in, in a moment. Um, but first, I, I wanted to ask a different, slightly different question, which is about uh, the extent to which you've used literature drawn from sociology and, and medicine and uh, psychotherapy and, some, and so on, re relating to alcohol addiction and violence. And, and I, I see that you've, you've referred to some of that uh, literature in, in your notes and particularly in, in the introduction, but I, but I sense that there's a slight tension in the sense that by, by drawing on that literature, uh, it, it could be interpreted as, as somehow excusing the perpetrator's behavior. And I wonder if you worried about that as you were reading that stuff. Well, actually, you know, uh, uh, this again, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about Chris's book, Ordinary Men, because I think he was really one of the first, you know, in the uh, at the end of his book, when he's explaining the behavior of Police Battalion 101, he talks about Stanley Milgram, he talks about Philip Zimbardo, he talks about uh, Erwin Staub's work. And so he kind of opens up a door for thinking about the, those behaviors in light of social science literature. And I think that was actually a, a, a great thing uh, for historians uh, who look at perpetrator motivation. Uh, because if we just look at it historically, I think what happens to us is the sources in many cases make it very difficult uh, for us to make some of the assumptions that we might otherwise be able to make. So in looking at sociology, for example, and looking at criminology and looking at psychology, when you see studies uh, that focus on specific uh, types of groups, their use of alcohol, how, uh, for example, gang behavior can be described, use of alcohol and tied to acts of masculinity, but also tied to uh, acts of violence uh, by, uh, by these groups. If we look at uh, Peggy Sanday's work, which I, uh, I talk about for sexual violence, uh, she focused on a, uh, a specific uh, uh, university fraternity in the United States. And she looked at uh, the way these fraternity students drank uh, 
uh, but also uh, their involvement in group uh, in gang rapes. And in her discussion of that, one of the things that she talked about was the act of sexual violence by the group was not so much about the act itself, about uh, the physical act, but about the shared bonding that, the, that each of the participants got. And so when I started to see that literature for me, uh, it really adds a dimension uh, to talking about, I have the historical evidence, but I can also then tie, I, I can then tie some of the social science literature uh, into these discussions of alcohol and aggression, sexual violence, uh, especially. And what I do think that that does is it does broaden, uh, it does broaden number one, the applicability uh, of the study beyond, uh, for example, just Germany uh, and German perpetrators in, in this uh, in this uh, case, but also it opens our uh, it opens our historical aperture to looking at sources in different ways that we might not have uh, have done. And so, for me, I think that that's a positive of it. Now, it, for sociologists and psychologists who read the book, uh, what will be an interesting kind of the litmus test on that or the acid test will be, do they feel that the way that those sources have been incorporated uh, into the discussion uh, reflect, uh, you know, uh, fully reflect uh, their own discipline and uh, is it done in a sophisticated way? My hope would be yes. Uh, you know, and uh, and I, again, I do think uh, that uh, that that is an aspect of the book for us as historians. Twenty years ago, would I have been comfortable doing that? Probably not, right? And and again, that's I think some of the maturation uh, that takes place over the course of your career and in the profession. Yes, thank you. Um, and, and well, following on from that, then uh, because of course the, you know the, the social science literature that you draw on comes from different settings across the world and at different times and different sorts of uh, groups of people or individuals uh, that are being uh, examined. And so the, the question I, I suppose arises as to what's distinct about Nazi Germany and the Holocaust in this regard. So you, you refer at one point to the fact that alcohol rations have uh, been a common feature of military life. You talk about the grog rations in the British Navy or the use of banana beer in um, the Rwanda genocide. So what's what's distinctive here about, about the German case? Yeah, I think there's a lot of similarity with a lot of other cases. And I'm glad you mentioned Rwanda because as I say in the book, that's a, I think that's a case that deserves its own study. But what's distinctive about Nazi Germany is a great question because what I think is this idea of hyper-masculinity and the way I define it is kind of an extreme conception of militarized masculinity. And it's kind of within a rigid patriarchal uh, racial hierarchy and it links things like sexuality, racism, uh, and war to this kind of ideal of German manhood. And so what we see in a highly structured, gender, genderfied, if you will, uh, Nazi Germany, uh, in this kind of, if you will, uh, uh, this raising of masculine uh, virtue and the way it's defined as uh, being uncompromising, being tough, uh, being ruthless against one's enemy. And then you tie it into, uh, into that racialized society uh, as well, it, I think what you really start to see is it creates its own specific type of masculine values and masculine uh, expectations. And uh, to me, uh, coming across that, uh, when, I, when I first started this project in 2016, I published a, uh, uh, an article in Holocaust and Genocide Studies that was the initial the initial article, and I really did not have masculinity uh, in this, uh, in that article. But uh, looking at Thomas Kuhn's work, looking at Dagmar Herzog's work, and and many others uh, who have who have looked at this idea of gender and especially masculinity, it really became clear to me that this was part of a missing link in being able to look at the how these men bonded, how they created shared community, uh, and what it meant. And to give you one example, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't start when Hitler takes power uh, in 1933. We see this dynamic is established with the stormtroopers and the creation of these all-male spaces 
for the stormtroopers, these SA bars or Kneipen, these SA homes. And these become dominated male spaces that also become spaces of political mobilization uh, and a political uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, group think, uh, if you will, amongst the other groups and norms and expectations that are tied to military uh, norms and expectations in many cases. And then they become sites for actually moving out in political violence against uh, the uh, against particularly the groups of the left uh, in uh, in uh, in Germany. So Weimar Germany right uh, starts to uh, uh, starts to see this. And the other thing that was really interesting to me uh, in looking at those kind of gendered spaces uh, is we see that ge geography is a male space. And if women are allowed in, for example, which happens rarely, they're not allowed to drink alcohol. For example, they can have limonadas or a soft drink or water. Uh, but so it, it, it also starts to define uh, what, uh, what kind of behaviors are appropriate uh, for men and women. And by the time we get to the war, that geography becomes the masculine battlefront and kind of the feminine home front as well. So space itself uh, is being gendered in different ways uh, uh, over the course of the war. So uh, the chronology of the war and the time. And I think that that insight, right, that insight about the nature of, uh, of masculine virtue, if you will, in quotation marks in Nazi Germany really goes a long way to explaining some of the behaviors we see there. And could it exist in other, uh, in other times and other places? Absolutely, yes. But I think all those factors that I talked about, the racial state, uh, to borrow uh, uh, Michael Burley and Wolfgang Wippermann's uh, uh, book title there, really goes far to help us explain what's kind of unique, if you will, about Nazi Germany. Brilliant, thank you. Um, well, I mean, in, in your answer there, you've already anticipated um, the, the question I wanted to ask you about masculinity, but I will uh, press on with it anyway, because I think there's a, a slight a slight nuance to it, which is that in, in the book, you don't just talk about uh, masculinity and male bonding, you talk about performative masculinity. That's your crucial concept, I think, to um, to explain uh, this, this male behavior. Can, can you say a little bit more about what you mean by performative masculinity and how it manifests itself in, in this context? Yeah, and, and, uh, and I'm glad you mentioned that because I actually should have talked about that. And performative masculinity, I think, works two ways uh, when I'm talking about Nazi Germany. It's performing for the others in your, in your gender, right? So uh, where we have camp guards, right, who will compete uh, shooting competitions or beating competitions uh, against one another. We have a, a number of cases that I talk about where in the killing fields, people will keep count of how many they've killed, boast about it, brag about it, argue about it in the pub uh, after, they, uh, after they come back from the killing, who had more. And with the idea that the more you have, the better shot you are, the better you're able to beat someone, the better man you are. And then we also see uh, a manifestation of performative masculinity also with respect uh, to, uh, to women in Nazi Germany. So uh, for me, some of the surprising uh, uh, surprising part of this is that uh, a policeman comes back from a from a shooting. Uh, he's uh, literally got blood and and body matter of his victims on him. And what does he do? He decides to go see the secretary that he likes. Uh, you know this female auxiliary, uh, and he doesn't bother to change. Uh, he goes and sees her because his expectation in doing that is that that will impress, that will be uh, something that she would be impressed by, right? Uh, and uh, so you have a really, uh, you know, a, a really interesting dynamic in the way that, the, that these men also see their actions with respect uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to women. And what you also see um, is in some cases where women, in this case, I use the case of a camp guard, at Majdanek, uh, there's a female prisoner who's being beaten actually by a male SS guard. Uh, and one of the female SS guards uh, takes, the, uh, uh, takes the, uh, the whip away from him and says, you're not doing it right. She starts to beat the woman. Uh, uh, and uh, when you look at that, what's happening there is she's appropriating her gender ideal, not from the gender ideal for women in the Third Reich, but against the manifestation of the male gender ideal. And uh, Wendy uh, Lower's book, Hitler's Fury, has, has an example uh, of Erna Petrie who uh, shoots uh, these Jewish children. And when she's questioned by the East German police, 
after the war, her, her response as to why she did it uh, is she didn't want to stand behind the men, right? Her husband's an SS officer. She'd seen these things happen. She wants to measure up you know, to this, uh, to this ideal. So I think it really, what really you get to see, especially in those latter uh, uh, instances, is the corruption of that ideal uh, in its kind of transmission uh, into the broader society, if you will. Thank you. There has been a question actually um, in the chat already relating to uh, Wendy's book, and so I'll, I'll come back to that after we've finished the, the formal part of, uh, of the discussion. But, um, well, I mean, you've alluded to this already, but the, and I said at the start that the book is tough to read um, because of these examples that you give throughout the book, um, and I don't want to read endless examples of them, but I, I wanted to ask you about the the different sorts of sources that you've used because the, the range of references is, is extraordinarily uh, wide um, in, in the footnotes uh, but just to, I just wanted to give one example I mean this is plucked more or less at random from the book at one point you say in September 1941 in the Latvian town of Olina SS and policemen gang raped a group of women and young girls in front of their friends and relatives before burying them alive I mean, it's horrific. And yet, you know, the book is full of, of instances like this. How, how do you work with them? How do you make sense of them? Well, I, I, you know, two of the concepts that have come, come to my mind and I kind of talk about in the book is this idea of recreational or spectacular violence. I, I, I talk about both those. And um, coming from a U.S. context where I've taught, for example, civil war in the United States, we look at the Jim Crow South, we look at the antebellum South, we see lynching, we see acts of violence, racialized acts of violence, right? And I think that uh, what... Um, what we see there is when when these acts of violence are are done in the public domain, uh, it's really important as to what it gives us an insight into the nature of what the perpetrators are thinking, because it's not just about the control over the uh, over the person. It's now about the control over that geography and a kind of a public statement of their control uh, over those places. And uh, to me, uh, you know, when we look at this again. Uh, uh, what we start to see is a very different picture uh, of the way in which violence is conducted. Uh, and there are parts, there is one example that I, I, I won't repeat it here. It has to do with a policeman and some young girls. Uh, and uh, I really, really was conflicted about putting this in there because it's really a, a horrific example. Uh, but you know, uh, some of my friends who have been Holocaust survivors, I, I know, Dan, you knew Zev Weiss very well. And Zev was a good friend of mine and uh, unfortunately passed away last year. But Zev would always make uh, the uh, comment at Lessons and Legacies that, you know, we can't, as historians, we can't understand the Holocaust. And, and I knew he was right. Uh, I can't understand it because I haven't been through it. But I think one of the things that, uh, that uh, these examples uh, do, and I think Grossman, uh, for example, in talking about this as well, was getting to after the war, is if we don't confront these types of actions, we really don't understand, we really can't understand uh, what it was like for those who experienced uh, these kinds of events. And um, to me, uh, that's a, that can be a very slippery slope that you go down, uh, but I think it's also kind of very important uh, because you've talked about these paradigms that we've kind of established. And I think it's really important not to lose the fact that uh, when I'm citing uh, these, um, these survivor and witness accounts uh, that are out there that really start to give us a deeper insight into what the victims experienced as a result of this. And as horrific as that is, I also think it's important uh, uh, for, for us as historians, but also to really give credit to the types of experience that they underwent, that, they, uh, that, they, that occurred to them. Uh, and uh, that's that's kind of the answer I would give to that question. Thank you. Um, OK, um, well, it's already nearly 22. So let, let me turn to uh, the question about the, the central arguments of the book, um, because um, I want to ask you about how to understand what precisely it is you're saying about alcohol in, in relation to the Holocaust and perhaps to genocide more 
generally? Because at one point you say that alcohol was less a determinant of genocide than a facilitator of genocide. Um, and you talk about other factors also uh, being important. Um, and as you said at the outset, you also are talking about literal intoxication, um, the perpetrators actually being drunk on alcohol, but also a metaphorical intoxication, the, the rouse, the, the excitement, this, this notion of, of enjoyment of transgression and so on. Um, and and I, I felt there was a slight tension in the book at times between, between the literal arguments about the role played by alcohol, because you also say that not all of the perpetrators were drunk all of the time, nor did they always need to be, uh, and the metaphorical one. So can I kind of push you a bit on what is the, the core argument of the book? Yeah, well, uh, well, I can tell you, first of all, what the core argument is not, and I kind of uh, lay that out in the book. Uh, alcohol was neither necessary nor sufficient to explain the Holocaust. The Holocaust would have happened without drinking, without these intoxicants uh, uh, being used. But what I do think uh, that the, where the core argument of the book gets to is how these manifestations of uh, this hypermasculinity that I talk about uh, is tied uh, to group camaraderie, social cohesion, which is tied in to a great degree uh, to also use of uh, literal, literal intoxicants, alcohol in that case, and most importantly, what it starts to show us about the mindset of the perpetrators as we look at this kind of catalog, as you noted, of these kind of examples of individuals who are involved uh, in these, type, uh, these types of actions. And so, uh, for example, if you look linguistically, uh, this idea of uh, Miriam Schultz uh, did a great article, uh, it's on Horbunschbach, right? So the idea of uh, uh, this uh, destruction or uh, 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 speech that uh, that uh, comes out of Yiddish. And when you have individuals who are watching these events, describing a, quote, wedding atmosphere, describing, quote, a ball or a kind of a ball or dancing or music incorporated into it, uh, I think that you can't, you cannot underestimate the importance of witnesses who saw that in Eastern Europe. And the reason is, for them, the single day that would be the most festive day and most of their lives is going to be related to some kind of wedding or, or wedding celebration. And so that the way that they're interpreting the actions of the perpetrators using that linguistic, right, that, that linguistic metaphor, that language uh, of wedding atmosphere, of Volksfest, of carnivals, right, or whatever the case might be, uh, what we're really starting to see now uh, is the nature of how those perpetrators thought about what they were doing. Uh, and to me, that complicates, that really complicates our understanding uh, of uh, perpetrator motivation from uh, men who, you know, reluctant participants, uh, or for example, if we look at, uh, if we look at some of the medical literature, when I hear, or you read about, well, of course, Jaeger had stomach problems, couldn't sleep, had bad dreams, and he was the head of Einsatzkommando 3. Uh, and then when you find out that a year after uh, his, uh, his group, had essentially uh, wiped out the Lithuanian Jewish population. He stages a reunion with his lieutenants back in Lithuania in December uh, of 1942. And that's not easy to do. It requires travel permissions. It requires a lot of things. So they're holding a reunion to do what? Talk about what they did, what they accomplished uh, the previous year. And to take Jaeger as an example, then, uh, uh, if you look at medical literature, if you're drinking lots of alcohol, especially distilled liquors, well, some of the manifestations of that are going to be sleep deprivation, poor sleep, and um, uh, also intestinal distress, intestinal action. So the way that it's interpreted is this is a psychosomatic reaction. Uh, to the fact that they're killers. Again, I think that, that, uh, that, that some of this really starts to add, uh, give us a different way of looking uh, at, uh, at, at these perpetrators and, and what their mindset is. And, and ultimately, I think that that's probably the red thread that connects this, uh, this work with my previous work on the police is still trying to look at these factors and determinants of, uh, uh, of behavior. Uh, and it, again, doesn't mean that everybody uh, uh, it's not a hegemonic view of, uh, of perpetrator behavior, but what it really does is it shows us that that view, uh, that aperture, that group who's involved in this is much broader uh, than a small percentage 
uh, of those that we've talked about in some cases in the past. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I think um, because it's quarter to now, uh, maybe we should um, take some questions because there are lots of great questions um, waiting to be uh, answered. So uh, I will uh, try and try and pick out um, ones that I think um, follow on from what we've already discussed and that raise new uh, new issues. And the very first one that came through was uh, from Hannah Starman, which says, uh, "I'm curious." about what Professor Westerman thinks of the Nazi widespread use of methamphetamine and how it fits into his work on alcohol. Yeah, and that's a, that's a good question because obviously Norman Oler's book, uh, the English title Blitz uh, uh, is um, not, uh, it's kind of controversial. And I talk about that in terms of, if we look at things, the so-called Panzer Schokolade, right? Methamphetamine for, for armored crews or for pilots as they to keep them awake. Uh, in the Eastern campaign, I think one of the cautions we have to we have to have in looking at this is cause and effect. Uh, you, I, I think it's very it's very easy to say, well, okay, they were uh, you know they were methed up to their eyeballs, so that's why they uh, that's why they uh, did the things that they did. They really didn't know what they were doing. The drugs were doing it essentially, and uh, that's problematic. And that's why I say alcohol is neither necessary nor sufficient. Uh, the uh, the other thing. Uh, that uh, that I think uh, is important to remember is if you have an army of 3 million and 18 million uh, in the Wehrmacht over the course of its existence, even if you have, let's say, 58 million doses of Pervitin, if you start doing the math on that, uh, it, it becomes very clear that uh, not everybody is taking it. Uh, and certainly there are individuals who are addicted, no doubt, no doubt about it. But uh, one of the uh, things that Heinrich Himmler does is he's writing about alcohol all the time. Tell the guys not to drink. Tell them if they drink that they drink moderately. Uh, I don't want to see people using their firearms when they're drunk, uh, you know, against their uh, against their fellow policemen or SS. But I, I have not found one example where he talks about the use of pervidin or narcotic drugs. Uh, in, in, and so I think that's really, really telling uh, within, uh, within the uh, SS and police uh, complex. So uh, again, I think that uh, the pervidin argument can be overdrawn and that's what I would, uh, I would caution against doing. Yeah, thank you. There's a couple of questions, I think, which pick up on something that we've already mentioned, but perhaps worth um, asking again. And this one from Dina uh, Jacobson, who says, uh, does it show sympathy or in some way excuse the killers by explaining that they were under the influence when they killed? Do we in some way minimize the evil they were capable of? Uh, yeah, and that's it. That's, again, another really good question, because it gets to uh, in uh, in German law and even for SS and police courts, uh, so to be completely drunk can be seen as a mitigating factor. And that's also in sentencing after the war uh, that uh, that. Uh, alcohol usage could be seen as a mitigating factor amongst the perpetrators. Uh, and in fact, um, what's really interesting is this, uh, this, uh, this kind of masculine ideal that I talk about, about the ability to hold your liquor, is that uh, a number of the killers who are clearly drinking uh, excessively are saying it doesn't affect me, right? So they're still holding, they're still holding to that masculine idea. Oh yeah, I can drink, you know, I can drink everyone on the table and I'm gonna be fine because I'm a, I'm a superior male in this case. And so um, I think that, you know, uh, that that's an important, uh, that's an important uh, point that what happens is that the way that drinking is conceptualized uh, especially after the war in some of these trial transcripts or in some of these interrogation is the perpetrators start to use alcohol as an alibi when in fact uh, the instances I quote it's very much a celebratory kind of tied in uh, to their participation in this group and uh, some of the some of the viewers today uh, might be familiar with Mad Men uh, the kind of U.S. Uh, you know, Fifth Avenue advertising series that, uh, and it, one of the things that people are struck with is it's 10 o'clock and they're throwing back bourbon and scotch, uh, you know, in their meetings. And we think now today, we think, well, oh my gosh, that's, uh, you know, that's crazy. They're all alcoholics. But you see, we start to miss the point. We start to uh, create a contemporary uh, kind of perceptual framework about what drinking is 
and, and then we transpose it back to the back uh, to the past, right? When that framework uh, is completely different in the way that alcohol is consumed uh, and used, and that's not just in Germany, that's in the U.S. Uh, for example, if I went to a New York uh, working class neighborhood uh, in the 1940s, uh, the bar is essentially a male space. Women, if they're allowed, are in a back room, and uh, their reputations aren't very high, and the men are drinking and they're fighting. Right, so it's about your use of your fist and your ability to drink. And so those masculine, uh, those kind of masculine ideals transcend, I think, uh, uh, these periods. And what we consider to be, oh, they were blotto. I think we have to be really kind of careful with that, uh, that because alcohol toleration and the way it's used uh, over the course of, uh, by some of these killers really gives us that, uh, that insight that I talk about, that it's not that they're drinking to not know what they're doing. They're accompanying what they're doing with the act of drinking, with the act of eating, which uh, we haven't been able to talk about. So thinking about moving from a killing site, a grave site, going to a table a uh, hundred yards away to eat and drink, and then move back right to the killing site. I mean, th those are the types of, those are the types of examples uh, that really, I think, start to give us a different view of how the perpetrators are dealing with what they're involved in. Agreed. Thank you. I think some of the passages in the book about the, the festive dimensions of, of killing are really, uh, I mean, not just shocking, but ex extremely uh, instructive in terms of uh, understanding the culture of, uh, of the whole killing process. So, yeah, I, um, uh, thank you for that. Um, there's a, a really interesting question from Paul Foster, who says that you mentioned uh, hunting Jews. And is it useful to see German hunting culture as informing the language and practice of murder? Yeah, absolutely. And in the book, I have a chapter uh, that part of that chapter deals with the idea of hunting because uh, hunting is a very much an encoded masculine event. And what you what you see and what I talk about in the book is the incorporation of terms from hunting uh, in the, in the annihilation destruction of European Jews by the perpetrators, whether it's Fangschuss, uh, you know, the killing shot, if you will, Taibiach, right, those kinds of those kinds of things. And what you also see is the instigation of hunting uh, as a way to target Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto, for example. Uh, uh, I have a Josef Lusha, who's a uh, uh, who's an SS uh, guard, and he talks about riding on a rickshaw and shooting uh, at Jews, like almost on safari. Uh, Wendy's book uh, talked about, for example, these men who go out on carriages for a uh, uh, for a uh, a uh, rabbit hunt, and they have these beaters who are Jews are supposed to beat uh, the prey in front of them, right? And they brought women with them and they're drinking and singing. And so what do they decide, what do they decide to do? Well, they're not having much luck at, uh, at shooting rabbits. So one of the guys starts shooting uh, the Jews who are acting as the beaters for the, uh, uh, for the game. Uh, and then she talks about these peals of laughter that you know, start uh, erupting. And here we have an example of performative masculinity, right? The men using the weapons uh, in this case, performing for these women uh, and, uh, and murder as being that kind of performative uh, activity that, uh, that's being involved here. So I think, you know, again, the hunt uh, is a masculinely encoded activity and the way it's used uh, is important. And for me, you know, we talk about the Third Reich is, is riven by paradoxes, right? But one of the things I mentioned in the book uh, uh, is if we look at Auschwitz, there's actually a game warden. There's an SS game warden uh, for Auschwitz, the, uh, the entire area. And if you're an SS guard, you need a hunting permit uh, to, to, to kill a deer or a fox at Auschwitz, but you only need a pretext to kill a prisoner. And I think that that, again, is, is just one of those, uh, when you see that kind of uh, lined up uh, in, in this discussion, it really uh, gives you a different perspective uh, on the nature uh, of, uh, of the uh, individuals involved. Yeah, thank you. Um, and there's a related question, which is which is from Waitman, uh, uh, which says, um, did you find any evidence of drinking games connected directly with killing uh, in the sense, he says, of, of drinks as a reward or a penalty for prowess in killing? Yeah, and I, uh, I have to say, Waitman sent me a message. He was going to be here and said, I, I better make it worth it. So we'll have to see if he agrees that it was worth it after the fact. But uh, he's actually uh, accompanied me on this journey uh, for quite a number of years. We've talked about this, uh, about this project. And uh, the answer is absolutely. 
Uh, so for example, you have cases, uh, I talk about one that is again, especially horrific of a game that the killers are playing with infants or small children, where the, uh, the goal of the game is to be able to throw the child against the tree and to crack the child's skull. And the reward for successfully doing that, demonstrating your strength, your ability to aim and to do this horrific act is you get a glass of schnapps if you do it. You have in, for example, uh, some of the camps in the East, uh, games in which a prisoner will be told to hold a glass uh, in his or her hand. And then the SS guard, uh, there'll be a bet between the two of them. Can you hit the glass or not out of the hand? And, and in this case, if you shatter the glass with your bullet, uh, the prisoner is allowed to uh, just go back to work. And But if you hit the, the fingers or the hand, then the prisoner is executed because it's not able to work anymore. Uh, and you see how some of these games, killing games I talk about uh, in the book, are incorporated, murder games are incorporated by uh, both SS and police, but also in some cases by the Wehrmacht. Uh, in this. And these games that are played uh, are, again, another manifestation of performative masculinity skill uh, of, the, uh, of the individual and often are tied uh, to, uh, uh, to drinking, acts of drinking or uh, alcohol as a reward. Thank you. OK, um, Wendy's book has been mentioned a couple of times, Hitler's Furies. Uh, and there's a question from Henrietta Foster asking, uh, well, she says, in, in Hitler's Furies, Wendy Lauer suggests that whilst the men did use alcohol before going out to murder Jews in the East, the women did not, that they were stone cold sober when they killed children, women or the elderly in the street, in their homes, um, from a balcony or in the ghetto. Why did these women kill? Belief in the Third Reich or becoming male or aspiring to masculine values? Yeah, I, I think that that's uh, that's obviously uh, that's obviously uh, the, gets to the the heart of what Wendy's talking about. Why did someone like Erna Petrie uh, kill uh, kill these Jewish children on her own? Is she's aspiring to that particular ideal? Now, one of the other there's two other things. I, I think it's a it's an excellent question. There's two other examples that I could give you if we go to the camps, for example, uh, in the east. Uh, Female SS guards are allowed to have weapons, firearms, are allowed to carry revolvers. But what you see is the way, and uh, uh, Elisa Mylander has looked at this, what you see is the way they use their weapons is not for shooting, it's for beating. Uh, it's, it's for uh, pistol whipping uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, prisoners. And uh, the use of a weapon uh, is considered a male prerogative, essentially. Uh, in, uh, in, in Nazi Germany. So men are allowed to use weapons and, and using a weapon makes you even more masculine, right? So the ability to use a weapon and use it well uh, makes you even more masculine. I think that that's an, important, uh, that's an important point, especially when we see the gender differences in behavior with respect to the use of uh, uh, weapons by uh, SS male and female uh, concentration camp guards. So I think that's an important thing. The second point, uh, that I would bring up is that the good German girl based on, uh, based on Nazi worldview doesn't drink or smoke. Now, of course, we know that that's not true and many, many uh, German women uh, 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 smoke and drink, right? Either or, but the ideal type uh, is, uh, is, uh, is portrayed as someone who doesn't uh, drink and doesn't smoke. And so I think it, that that's also kind of explains that women who are in that true believer category are those who are buying into uh, uh, the ideals of the regime. Uh, there's also kind of an inhibitor for them to engage in those kinds of behaviors. Uh, so I think that that, that that might be part of the explanation as well. Brilliant, thank you. Um, Christine, do we have time for one more question? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, good. Um, then there's a question from uh, Bastian Willems that I, I thought would be an interesting one to take, which is, um, given your focus on the zone of exception, did you find examples of genocidal acts under the influence of alcohol on German soil and outside of the concentration camps? Yeah, great. I'm glad. I'm glad we got back to that uh, that question because I actually wanted to talk uh, talk about that. Uh, where we do see it is the zones of exception are the concentration camps in Nazi Germany, right before the war. Those are those kind of imagined areas, if you will, in which 
uh, in which the uh, the prerogatives of the laws outside that area don't matter. Now, what I think is also interesting about uh, 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 about that uh, is that we also have cases near the end of the war where uh, we see some of these behaviors taking place within what would be the alt by old Germany. Uh, and um, if we look at, uh, for example, some of these, uh, 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 these homes that are under Gestapo control, there's one example uh, uh, late, uh, late in the war of this, uh, uh, this, uh, this Jewish home that's under uh, Gestapo control where Jewish women and families are brought uh, essentially uh, and kept. And uh, one a young man remembers uh, as a boy how the Gestapo uh, agents would come at night. The women were up in the attic top floor and he talked about how they would go up the stairs into that space at night uh, and they would kick him out, throw him down the stairs that he talked about. But he didn't say what was going on up there. He did not verbalize that it was sexual assault, but it was very clear uh, from um, uh, very clear from uh, the uh, the context that that's what he's talking about. So I do think uh, that um, the zones of exception, as I talked about, chronology does play a role, uh, and uh, but it's the space mostly, and so they're they're isolated spaces. They're not the public spaces where public space can be used in the east for some of this. Uh, I don't think we see that that use uh, in uh, Germany proper of public space. Again, concentration camps, areas of confinement, prisons, yes, uh, but not uh, not public spaces. Brilliant, thank you. Well, we've, we've reached eight o'clock, so I guess uh, we should uh, we should wrap things up. So um, thank you. Thank you so much for um, giving us so many insights into into the book um, and congratulations again on it. Uh, and thank you for taking all those uh, questions and sorry to people whose questions I didn't get to um, to bring into the conversation. But that's been a really um, fantastic and very, very rich uh, discussion. So, so thanks, Ed, very much indeed. And I'll, I'll hand back to Christine. Thanks, Ed, too. I just want to reiterate our thanks on behalf of the library for agreeing to do this. And I've also had a lot of um, messages coming in privately and also in the chat thanking you for, for the talk. And it was brilliant. And thanks to Dan for, for chairing this uh, so brilliantly. Um, and, it, and to anybody, and just to plug uh, our other events, um, we, we did mention Wendy Lauer's book a few times, uh, Wendy Lauer's work a few times, and she's also going to be giving a talk uh, next month. So do check our website uh, for further information. Um, and thanks again to you both. And um, have a good night, everyone. Thank you for the great questions and for, for uh, participating in tonight's event. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate thanks. it. Bye.